So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. I'm Scott Podolsky and Jen Pusetti, Cal Benoit and I have been organizing this series of webinars related to how we can view the COVID-19 pandemic through a social medicine lens and act accordingly. And today we have the added privilege of co-hosting this with Harvard's Department of Anthropology, a number of its graduates as well. Um, we focused throughout the series on who gets sick, what meaning we ascribe to such illness, and how we respond individually and collectively. And no one has so influenced the discipline of social medicine or the members of our department as our former chair and current mentor and colleague, Arthur Kleinman. And when I broached with Arthur the possibility of putting together a webinar, he, A, generously offered to share hosting duties with me, and I've already learned a great deal from him in the planning stages, and B, recommended that we frame the session around the lived experience of COVID-19 as an opportunity to explore the shared themes of caregivers and care recipients alike, all the while acknowledging the intrinsic individuality of the human experience. We've put together a remarkable panel, again acknowledging that there are entire classes of caregivers, recipients, families, and friends whom we haven't represented today. Indeed, those very gaps will be telling in their own right, and they serve as the focus of future seminars. For now, though, we're in for a treat. We'll hear in turn from first Kim Su, physician anthropologist and medical director of the Harm Reduction Coalition, and among many other things, physician at the Rikers Island jail system, and that many other things will apply to everyone here. Next, we'll hear from Katie Peeler from the Division of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital, a medical director of the Harvard Medical Asylum Clinic. Then from Chuck Poo from the MGH Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine, a medical director of the Partners Center for Population Health. Then from Edna Ardell, professor in the Department of Environmental Health at the Chan School, professor of global health within our own department, and for today's purposes, an early recipient of a COVID-19 diagnosis. And then finally, from Jean Richardson, yet another esteemed physician anthropologist, we have four on the program today, veteran of confronting and researching the Ebola pandemic, and assistant professor of global health and social medicine here at HMS. They'll each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes before we turn this over to further reflections and commentary by me, Arthur, and by Arthur's proud former student and now successor as department chair, Paul Farmer, before we open things up for discussion. But before we hear from our speakers, we're privileged to have author Arthur offer his own framing. So, Arthur. Thank you, Scott. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone. We have a great panel. I don't want to take up too much time at this point, but I wanted to point out that it's a long tradition in social medicine, and particularly in that brand of social medicine that we have uh, been doing for so long at Harvard, which has been so strongly influenced by the medical anthropology background of a, of a considerable number of us and four on the panel uh, today, um, uh, to pay a great deal of attention to lived experience. The lived experience of patients, of family members, of community members, and of caregivers professional caregivers in particular. The focus of that, of that attention to lived experience is not just to get what a really good um, a journalist gets in a New York Times or Washington Post or Economist uh, article, um, but to go beyond that by having critical thinking look at experience. It's really intellect brooding on experience that gives us the kind of academic edge, I think, that makes that should make a webinar like this uh, particularly important. And here, we know that there are certain shared themes that no matter how individual our own experiences have been, we're going to hear or we're going to see illustrated. And I think that's the great thing about the stories we'll hear. Not only will we have the critical reflection, but we'll see how the illustrations bring alive vividly uh, what those reflections are about. And so we'll hear about, I'm sure, uncertainty, which is after all, uh, almost the uh, theme of our time for all of us who are in social, social isolation and for those who are right at the front of caregiving, both in families and particularly professionals. We'll hear about um, threat because um, this pandemic really is a threat. We'll hear about loss. We'll hear about the um, really, in some ways, the catastrophic 
um, response of the United States, which I think has shocked so many, so many of us. Um, uh, we'll hear about the extensions of, 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 of COVID-19, which brings our global world and another part of the global health and social De medicine department into focus. The fact that this is both local and global and global meaning really global, that virtually every country in the world has been, has been affected. Um, I hope at the end, as we begin to pull these things together and, and search for uh, interdigitating themes and, uh, and what they contribute to, that there'll be a practical contribution. That the practical contribution will be that the ideas we generate will tell us something about where the foci are today for doing better, um, where the foci are for more research, where the foci are for different kinds of policies. And also um, to think about in the broad sense, which is oh, after all uh, the great contribution of social medicine, the idea of social care, that all of the things we're gonna hear about today are gonna add up to the role of care in society. And if COVID-19 has done anything, it's to demonstrate how fundamental care is to society, the social glue that holds us together. Sometimes that glue frays and people fall apart. Sometimes it's strong and makes a, 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 a terribly important contribution. So with that, I don't want to uh, uh, keep us any longer from the main events. Let's hear from uh, Kim Su. I am going to try to share my screen with you. Um, so hopefully this works. Can you see my slides okay? Yes. So um, uh, thanks for having me, Arthur and Scott and everyone organizing. Um, it's such a pleasure to be on with uh, my friends and mentors in Boston and around the country. Uh, I miss MGH and I miss everyone at Harvard very much. Um, so I've been, uh, I'm the medical director of the Harm Reduction Coalition in New York and I've been working at the, the jails and for the last um, three weeks or so I've been in one of the temporary makeshift field hospitals in Queens. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences. I've been trying to keep a diary, some field notes, so this is a little improvisation. Um, you know, I've been working, you know, three weeks on with no days off. Um, and a couple, I just got off a couple nights. Uh oh, okay. Um, so, okay. So, um, in the beginning uh, of March, I was working for New York City Health and Hospitals on the uh, 311 uh, hotline. So, if anyone was concerned about COVID, uh, they could, in New York City, this is part of the public health and hospitals um, system, I was handling uh, phone calls uh, from New Yorkers, you know, all across uh, the boroughs. Um, I would note that, um, you know, really there was uh, intense fear um, and, you know, I fielded uh, calls from people, you know, who are already existing at these multiple axes of structural vulnerability and violence. Um, uh, you know, New Yorkers, uh, you know, I had one uh, case uh, where uh, the patient um, was speaking through an ASL interpreter um, and has, was living in Queens, uh, was worried they had uh, COVID uh, we did not have tests at the time, um, and we were we were not able to provide tests. Um, she uh, was deaf, and so she'd been to the emergency room a week before, and was really, basically, had sat there and really was worried that because she was deaf, um, she she was ignored, uh, which probably was the case. Um, and she returned home. She had a ton of symptoms. She lived alone. Uh, she had no neighbors uh, that could bring her food. She lived in one of the housing projects and she had no food. Uh, she had no family in the area. Uh, so again, you know, existing, New York is this amazing city where people are able to take care of themselves, um, live independently, you know, uh, so many access to services. And at the same time, I had very little to offer her. Um, so up in the right, you can see that there's a food delivery um, uh, that was actually in my building. Um, so New York City started to deliver and roll out food for people. 
um, there were so many people who were, I was fielding calls from people who wanted to, they were asking, should I shut down my business? Um, should I, um, you know, I have no idea what to do. I, I can't not go out. It's only me. I have to go to the store. Um, I know I, I have a cough. I've had a fever for two weeks, but I have to go out. So the idea of being able to isolate was really, is really a privilege. Um, so this is, this is the building in my own building um, where, where my, my landlord uh, or my, uh, my super was positive. Um, my super is an elderly uh, Haitian man who lived, is in his 70s. Um, you know, so he really does exist in multiple axes of structural vulnerability and risk of death. Um, some of these thoughts that, I, that I've written here, you know, thinking about the ways in which th these are things that all of us study and care about immensely and really we've cared about for a long time and really are coming into sharp, um, sharp focus here. Um, so one thing that I'd like to point out is, is you know, as a frontline healthcare provider, um, the idea of caregiving and risk, um, these ideas of safety and harm and you know, in New York City and around the country, we haven't had access to personal protective equipment. I've been wearing the same N95 for weeks. Um, and, you know, people from around the country have sent me, you know, uh, you know, generous donations. But the idea of what it means to uh, be able to care for people and care for people safely in this new environment, there's so much fear. And that goes uh, for health healthcare workers as well. So I, you know, I've been trying to document kind of the landscape of New York City as I go around. You know, I'm I'm allowed to go out. You know, I'm I have to go out. Um, this is from my um, my commute to Rikers uh, to one of the jails. Um, you know, this is these are from the Lower East Side. Um, really, uh, it's it's a very sad and uh, landscape uh, to see. So, you know, your vibrant city. Um, uh, you know, really, des you know, desolate. Um, here are some more uh, f photos from you know when I go out. But you know this idea of staying at home, you know, it really captured. I think that it's a luxury. It's to, it, you know, I, I said on a previous talk that if you don't know people who have died, um, it, it's a marker of your privilege here in New York City. Um, my one of my coworkers had, you know, two of her uncles died in 24 hours. Um, uh, you know, in one of the outer boroughs in Brooklyn, the Nigerian American community is being decimated. Um, in the middle, this is a, from Greenpoint. So the, the, the sign is in Polish. It's also in, you know, in Spanish and Polish. So, you know, demonstrating the, the, the ways in which, um, uh, you know, people who don't, ha you know, English is not their first language are immediately at higher risk. And here, uh, I also took a photo of people selling masks. Um, because masks and face, they're the, they're the new like handbags, like, you know, like this, this is like the, the, you know, what we see on the street now is face masks and, and, uh, and KN95s from, um, from China. So, you know, I was going to Rikers, um, I was going to jail and really um, being a doctor there, um, it, you know, it's, it's something I've been very dedicated to. This is my research is on, on prisons and jails. Um, so uh, being a doctor there is really important. Um, I've included some of my thoughts on Twitter where someone told me um, uh, this is the fish market, basically saying that, you know, a reference to, you know, what was thought to be where, um, where this initially emerged. But people really feel so much fear and there's so much anxiety um, and it's creating uh, tons of unintended consequences where people are policing the units. If, if people have COVID or not COVID, they're trying to keep people out. Um, if they do have COVID, they're going into solitary confinement. Um, you know, people are so afraid and the consequences in jail. Jail is already a very fraught and violent place to be. It's already a place that's very uh, bad for, you know, chronic disease and mental health and COVID on top of it is really ripping the seams of like kind of the social system inside prisons and jails. You know, I put up this thing from Twitter where you could see Cook County Jail, um, another correctional facility in Michigan, um, meat packing plants, more prisons, more nursing facilities. These are places that, you know, I, I think I so that already have, you know, embodied risks and vulnerabilities and are already um, unsafe and unhealthy at baseline. Um, and really uh, are set up um, to, to experience uh, epidemics within our uh, pandemic. 
So lastly, um, you know, I don't want to take too much time, but, you know, I've been in this makeshift hospital in Queens and Queens, uh, you know, is one of the most diverse boroughs in New York City. You know, there are, you know, hundreds of languages spoken in Queens um, and uh, really it, it's just been de you know devastated much like we were talking about chelsea massachusetts um these are places where you know people are coming uh from around the world to live um you know some of my patients uh they say things like so it's 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 you know might be eight people in a one bedroom you know and they tell me exactly how they they're tripling up you know he was saying i'll go back to the hallway my pregnant wife is in the one bedroom with our two children and my 80 year old mother is in the living room with another child um, you know, I'm taking, I can't send him back until he doesn't have a cough, you know, and so I'm, you know, how many stairs do you have to climb? Everyone in New York City has uh, three floor walk ups, you know, with COVID, we have patients who are dropping their oxygen sats when they walk, they might look fine on room air, and then they walk and their sats are in the 70s. So this, this guy, um, previously healthy, you might have to go up three flights of stairs. And, you know, I can't discharge him until he's able to basically maintain and rest and I don't want him to go out and fall down and syncopize and, and then, you know, basically end right back up in the hospital. So I've been attending, you know, here in the in this field hospital um, and it's all COVID. I mean, uh, you know, the one thing that I would say is that, you know, complicated medical care, you know, I take care mostly of patients with addiction um, and I practice harm reduction uh, medicine, you know, for most of my work and, you know, it's, it's really complicated to take care of people with alcohol use disorders and homelessness and uh, a variety of other things and COVID on top of it. So, um, you know, really I've been encouraging people on my teams to think comprehensively about mental health, about substance use, about, you know, um, how, uh, you know, what it, what it means to be safe. So, you know, it's really, uh, it's really difficult uh, down there in the, in the hospital. We don't examine anyone, right? Down there, I, I discharged a patient last week. Uh, you know, I don't really even know what day it is most of the time, um, but I discharged a patient last week and he grabbed my hand and wanted to hug me. And I almost was like, it was shocking to me almost because we don't touch patients, um, you know, really very much anymore. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's part of our regular practices of care to examine patients and really examining patients is, is, not, is not recommended for, for COVID care if it doesn't change management. So these are just some of my thoughts um, and I'm happy to talk uh, more in the, in the question and answer, but you know, I, I've been toggling between these various sites as a physician and as, as an anthropologist and, you know, really trying to, trying to um, you know, attend to what we all care about, uh, you know, people who are already at most risk, who are already experiencing structural violence and vulnerability and see them through this. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kim. Thank you, thank you, Kim, for turning attention to, the, to the, these vulnerabilities and, and, and to such existing structural violence and how it's shaping this pandemic. Uh, we'll next turn to, to Katie Peeler. All right, thank you. Let me try to share my screen. All right. All right, that looks okay? No. Yes, okay, great. So um, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be part of this panel. Um, I wanna talk about the care of socially and medically vulnerable children during this pandemic. Obviously there's a lot of different types of socially vulnerable kids and medically vulnerable kids. And I'm gonna talk about two populations that I've worked with a lot in the last few years, but um, really in the last few weeks with respect to this pandemic. So I'm just gonna briefly just review pediatric COVID just because as we know, mostly it's an adult disease and that's what's been talked about most in the news. So I just wanna give a few highlights for this audience and then turn to a bit how um, COVID-19 as a disease, but also as a mental state, as a pandemic, what that, what that means for the effects of care of unaccompanied immigrant children in the US as well as medically complex children in the US. So, you know, really is an adult disease. Um, pediatric, their children certainly carry co coronavirus, um, but they don't necessarily tend to get symptomatic um, from this particular strain. Um, and when they do get symptomatic, it's much less severe. Um, and so the thought is that there's higher rates of nasopharyngeal carriage, um, carriage, but they don't necessarily have lower airway involvement um, in the sense that they don't tend to get pneumonia, ARDS, et cetera. 
Um, there is, there's some preliminary studies that show there is probably fecal shedding of the virus for weeks after diagnosis. Um, and you'll note at the bottom of my slide that I mentioned that that's not awesome for people with small children. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, and A, I wouldn't suggest trying to potty train anyone during a pandemic because it doesn't work. Um, and B, kids don't wash their hands for 20 seconds. So they certainly are carriers um, and can help spread the disease. Um, that being said, there are instances of severe symptomatic disease. It's not unknown by any means. Um, around the world, as well as in the hospital that I work at here in um, Boston, we've seen kids with really severe hyperinflammatory states, cytokine storm. Um, we have children at the hospital right now who have really severe myocarditis, um, who are on kind of extreme forms of life support kids who've had and died from encephalitis, um, and then kids who've had similar disease to what the adults have with um, ARDS and pneumonia. And then anecdotally, um, it seems that it might be a setup for other disease processes. So we've seen a lot more DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis recently, um, which, which often um, kind of you see in the context of a virus. I'm not saying it's causative, but certainly there's been a lot more DKA. And then there's also been, um, in our personal PICU, we've had a lot more children coming in with ingestions um, and um, attempts at suicide, which I'll get to in a, in a little bit. So kind of um, switching gears to unaccompanied children, I do think a, a, just a little bit of background is important. Um, so who these kids are. So an, an unaccompanied um, minor uh, immigrant in the United States is, is officially called an unaccompanied alien child. Uh, they're under 18, they have no lawful immigration status, and either they arrive by themselves, so they arrive without a parent or legal guardian, or maybe they arrive with one, but the, the federal government decides that the caregiver that they arrived with is not appropriate to provide care or physical custody. That's a whole other separate talk as to whether or not that, that makes sense, but kids, um, they end up becoming unaccompanied children by virtue of arriving by themselves or being separated from their family upon arrival. And then what happens is that they transition from being under the custody of ICE to then being under the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is very different. That, that falls under the umbrella of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And these numbers have increased a lot. So in 2012, there were around 13,000 children who were referred um, from ICE to ORR. Um, and then in the ensuing years, in 2019, there's now been um, 67,000. So 67,000 children in 2019, at some point during that year, were in the custody of ORR. Um, at any given time, it's usually a couple thousand because they tend to be in custody for a couple months and then are um, released to an appropriately vetted sponsor. The demographics have mostly been the same for the past few years. So around two thirds are boys. Um, the, major the vast majority come from um, the Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador with around 5% from Mexico and then a handful from other countries around the world. Um, most kids are older, 15 to 17 years of age, but there's still a, a decent number who are young. So 16% are considered tender age, so they're under, they're under 12 years. Um, and then where they are is that OR has several different types of facilities. There's shelters, there's staff secure shelters, which is for kids who are either at risk of hurting themselves or others. There's residential treatment centers, which is for children who have higher levels of mental health needs. Um, and then there are kids who are in federal um, foster care. So they're still under the custody of ORR, but they're in foster care settings while they kind of await placement elsewhere. And then that, this is really important to note. So as you may remember from a couple of years ago, there was the kind of official federal separation policy um, where we were separating children from their parents at the border as a means of deterrence, which didn't work and was just cruel um, and basically torture. That theoretically ended in June 2018, but since that that policy ended, the government has still separated over a thousand children from their parents. And of those thousand children who've been separated in the last year and a half, 300 were under five years of age. So just imagine either your own five-year-old, if you have one, or when you were five, being basically torn away from your parents. Um, and so you're without anyone that knows or loves you. You're in uh, custody of a bunch of strangers. And then now there's a pandemic going on. So the strangers taking care of you are highly stressed. So it's not, it's not an awesome um, setup. So what about actual COVID-19 in OR settings? So not surprisingly, the virus has spread as it has in many other congregate um, facilities. Um, so first it was just with um, people who worked at the shelters. So there were three in some of the New York shelters um, in late March. Then there were seven further at a Houston area shelter. Um, and then just a, a week and a half ago, there were 37 children um, who tested positive, some who actually were uh, sick and needed to leave um, in Chicago. And so now there's at least 40 kids who've tested positive in the various OR facilities of the around 2,500 kids that are currently in custody. Um, and at least 70, if not more, um, employees um, 
staff members, and foster parents who have tested positive. And this is despite or really taking, um, and ICE, taking some measures, um, or at least stating that they're taking some measures um, to socially distance people, to increase hand hygiene, et cetera. And so the challenges for care of these kids are many. Um, and so, you know, we talk about the one, two punch, but this is really like the one, two, three, four, and you could keep counting punch. Basically, there's a lot of compounding and mental health trauma of these kids. So every single child who is, who is unaccompanied has suffered some sort of trauma in their home country. They either um, grew up originally by themselves because their parents left to go seek a better life and send money home from the United States, or they suffered um, direct trauma. They've watched their, their parents be murdered. They have been serially raped because they wouldn't agree to be in a gang. Um, there's kind of a, a long, unfortunate list of, of things that could have happened. Then it's not easy to get here. So they suffer trauma just coming to the United States, either um, being exposed to the elements, not having any food. Um, it's a lot of children end up riding these various um, cargo trains throughout Mexico to get to the US, which are really dangerous and often lead to death. Then you get to the US and you're in a detention center um, where that's, that's traumatizing in and of itself for a child. Um, and then there's actually direct trauma that happens in detention centers sometimes, unfortunately. And then now we also have the pandemic. And so um, they are scared. They don't, these children don't really understand what's going on outside. Um, the caregivers are wearing masks and um, using other PPE, but the kids aren't. Um, they don't know what's going on with their parents back home. They have no idea what the setting is of the pandemic. And the kids who are older, who kind of know enough to know that it's probably worse in their home countries, are, are scared for their families' um, uh, health and well-being. Um, and then the other things that are kind of happening is that the, the policies in place just don't really make any sense. So while, um, ORR is trying to follow certain regulations um, in terms of social distancing and not letting people out of custody. Um, the actual legal offices that, that, that um, direct their cases are not following into those guidelines. So the courts have not closed. Some kids are still required to show up to court um, in New York in person. Um, and so they are on buses, they are in crowded um, um, courtrooms, um, and it's just a very kind of dangerous scenario from a public health standpoint. And there's other kids who are trying, they're trying to do their legal proceedings via Zoom. And this, again, this includes these tender age children. So there are, um, I talked to an attorney in New York who was representing a four-year-old. And so the four-year-old was supposed to call in to court via Zoom with an interpreter and talk to a judge and an attorney um, on Zoom, which is just unfathomable um, as to how that's possibly appropriate. Um, there are kids being held, um, you know, Kim had mentioned sol solitary confinement um, in um, a jail setting, and that's also happening in these um, detention, or not detention centers, but in these um, shelters. So kids who are either positive or have symptoms are being um, put in solitary kind of isolation, which is not even remotely appropriate for um, the development of a child ever, and certainly not when they're scared and don't understand what's going on. Um, so the, the, there, are, there are some things happening, but there's, there's just not enough. And I think that the kind of main point is that what we've been working for, which I think is the next slide, one second here, yes, is um, the main thing that we've been doing is, uh, is um, trying to move these um, kids along through the courts. And so as many of you may um, know, there is the Flores Settlement Agreement, which is kind of a longstanding agreement from 1997 that dictates the care of children in federal custody. And so the, the two primary points are the, the interest of the child always takes precedent, and then number two, that kids need to move um, out of these settings as soon as possible. And so um, essentially we've, we've um, submitted a lot of various lawsuits um, challenging the government and saying that they're not, they're not standing by the Flores Settlement Agreement. And so actually, even, even as of, I think, two days ago, um, we've had a lot of victories. And so um, essentially, the, the, the um, courts have found that both ICE and ORR are in violation of these, um, the Flores Settlement Agreement and that they need to release children much faster to sponsors that already exist. And I will say that most kids already do have sponsors lined up, um, have been screened that are safe. Most of them are actually their, their parents or family members. They're not kind of, they're not random strangers. They're usually relatives. Um, and so it's just a matter of actually releasing them. 
Um, and, and all these children and parents who are in these detention facilities are not, um, these are all civil proceedings. These are not um, criminal proceedings. And so they're being kind of held in dangerous conditions essentially against their will. And so we've been arguing this for many, many cases. Um, and actually a lot of kids have recently been released, which is great, and some adults as well from the family residential centers. Um, and then lastly, I just kind of want to transition in my last few minutes just to talk about um, my other hat, so essentially in the PICU. Um, and so in our PICU in Boston, a lot of our kids have um, underlying comorbidities. They have a lot of medical complexity. Um, and at any given time in my unit, um, I would say 80% of the children um, are, are kids with underlying disorders and 20% are previously healthy kids. And, um, and usually we're full. And right now the PICU is uh, probably like 50% capacity because we've canceled all of our elective surgeries. Uh, and the other thing that's happening is that the kids who usually come in um, just aren't, aren't showing up. Um, and so when they do come, they're arriving later. So they're much sicker. Um, and um, I think the reasons being is that their parents are really scared to bring them in if they don't need to. The other thing that's happening is that once kids do come in, um, and these are, these are arriving for any diagnosis, not necessarily having COVID, just for anything at all. Um, when they do come in, I've had a lot of conversations with parents who are really scared to leave. At the beginning of the, of the epidemic, they were really scared that if they left, they would, quote, lose their bed. They were really scared that we were gonna fill up with adults as like an overflow hospital and that they would have no recourse or their kid would get stuck at some community hospital that didn't understand their underlying you know, metabolic disorder or whatever it was. Um, and so I had to really counsel people that, you know, basically promise them that we would always be there and they could, they, we would, where there's a will, there's a way and they would always be able to welcome back at our hospital. But that was, um, that was a big scare. And then now people are afraid to leave because they just feel like maybe they're safer in the hospital, which is not, not the case, but um, you can see where they're coming from. Um, I mentioned that we've had a lot more children um, come in with uh, mental health disorders. And so we've had a lot of kids come in with ingestions. Um, some who've had COVID, some who've had not um, and, and some kids with um, frank suicidal ideation. And one kid even in their actual, um, they had left a suicide note and said, that they couldn't really handle the social, social uh, isolation anymore. Uh, and they understood the reasoning, but they, they couldn't do it. Um, and, you know, fortunately, all these, none of these children have, have died, but, um, but I, we've had a, a real rash um, of ingestions recently and other, other ways of trying to commit suicide. From the parental standpoint, um, you know, I mentioned the fear is coming in coming into the PICU as well as leaving the PICU, but it's also just hard to be here. So um, you really feel alone. You know, Kim had mentioned how we really try to limit exams, and that's, that's true in children too. You know, I do my exam, but I don't have the NP or the resident do an exam. Like, there's not really any reason to have five people examine the patient. It doesn't actually add anything to their care, but it really, on the other hand, does limit their actual kind of emotional care. The child, if they're awake, um, I think feels quite lonely. The parents don't really feel connected to the team. It's really hard to round. We still try to practice family-centered rounds, but through Zoom. And sometimes it's like Zoom, like take two, because it'll be a parent calling another parent on FaceTime then holding their FaceTime phone up to our Zoom and then talking through the door. And so it's just, um, it's kind of a mess, frankly. Um, it's, it's the best we can do, but it's not awesome. Um, and then we've had a lot of children die recently, not related to COVID. Uh, and I know I'm kind of skipping over the COVID in the PICU. We've had it, but it's not much, I don't have a whole lot to say about that other than what you've seen in the news. But, you know, there's other, other things are happening. Kids are dying from other things. We've had a lot of children, unfortunately, who've died of their long-term uh, chronic illnesses. And it's been really hard for those families because they don't have a way of mourning appropriately. They can't have funerals. These are kids who've, you know, they're teenagers and they have these enormous social groups. And so if they were to have a funeral, there'd probably be a thousand people there normally. Um, and that, that can't happen right now. Um, and then I spoke with a friend of mine last night who's one of the attendings at a local uh, pediatric rehab hospital here in Boston. And um, their policy is that once, if a parent chooses to be with their, their child, they're not allowed to leave. So there are parents who've been in that building, like they can't go outside. They've been in that building for weeks, unable, unable to leave. Um, and so that is, that is, that's an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, and so the last thing I just want to transition to is, um, before I stop, is um, um, it's kind of a, a, I guess, a somewhat bright note um, around what Arthur was saying in terms of care. Um, I, I think one example of a really amazing way that a community has stepped up to care for a family was for one of these um, chronically ill children who had actually been in our PICU for about 
probably a year, a very long time. And she actually was ready, she was getting ready to go to a rehab facility and died somewhat unexpectedly. Um, but just keep in mind that her, her community had not seen her for at least a year. And so she died um, and our social worker um, wrote us an email that I'm, I'm gonna share here, which is okay to share. That says, um, spoke to mom today. They are having a small family service at the end of next week. The parents who are from Rhode Island had to quarantine for 14 days because they were in Massachusetts. I, I, I cry every time I read this, but I'll try not to. <clears throat> the community did a drive-by car parade for the family on Tuesday to honor the patient. Her teachers and classmates, police, fire, and ambulance from their town, friends and neighbors participated, many with red balloons. Mom said there were more than 100 cars. It was an unforgettable experience and very positive for their son. She's very sad they can't have a regular funeral, but the support from their community was unexpected and very comforting. That's where I'll end. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. So. Thank you, Katie. I mean, our, our, that's extraordinarily moving and, and pointing not only to some potential care responses, but also linking the, these vulnerabilities and problems with these systems with, with policy responses. And, and, and Chuck Poo will also lead us in that direction now. Chuck, you might be muted still. I'm mute here. Okay. Um, can you see this? Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, thank you again. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Catherine. Uh, on to the other side of the spectrum, the age spectrum. Uh, I'm going to give a, a perspective uh, for. Um, our older population. Uh, my wife, by the way, is a pediatrician and I'm a geriatrician. So um, I, I, uh, we get that comment all the time. But um, um, what was this? Um, my, uh, my friend's mother was a nursing home resident living at this uh, nursing home in Belmont. Um, and she's been there for 16 months. And she was 87 years old, and yesterday he buried her. Uh, she uh, tested positive for COVID um, about three weeks ago, but uh, developed some symptoms last week and succumbed to it and passed away this past Sunday. And uh, she um, uh, had severe advanced Alzheimer's. She couldn't recognize um, my friend, uh, her son, anymore, but he visited her every single week, every Friday around mealtime and spent an hour, hour and a half uh, uh, during that time. And prior to her coming to the nursing home, uh, she was at an assisted living for about a year and then to an assisted living uh, with the memory unit. And then ultimately, when she fell and couldn't take care of herself with the staff, they, uh, they, uh, she was uh, moved to this nursing home. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, when she fell at the assisted living, she broke her foot. It uh, didn't require any surgery, but that was the last time she was able to walk by herself. And she came into this nursing home at a, what we call wheelchair level, okay? Um, and this nursing home was a five-star nursing home. Um, and uh, my friend, uh, I never met his, uh, his mother, but he described uh, her last years as someone with advanced Alzheimer's with just a childlike kind of um, um, disposition. She was pleasant and, and, and she, her, her eyes would light up around mealtimes. And, um, you know, at the beginning uh, of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of the transition to this new home for her, you know, my friend would come and, you know, the staff were really cordial, but they would always kind of tell him what he wanted to hear, like, oh, she did well, she's doing well. But over time, and we hear this over and over with the people who are living in the community there, it really started to be very close and um, transparent and would tell her, tell him, really how she was doing. Well, um, you know, uh, in March, uh, my friend received the first notice, uh, like many uh, families did, uh, with COVID um, social distancing uh, policies uh, uh, and, and uh, screening policies for all people who were coming in and out. And then a week later, restricted visitor policies and then no visitor policy. 
okay? And then also at the same time within the nursing homes, all communal group activities stopped. No more communal dining, no more patients, all the residents were all restricted to their own rooms. And, uh, and then residents, uh, the, the patients there were, at, were asked to wear masks. And during this last month and a half, um, my, my friend would continue to have contact with his mother uh, with the help of the aides there. And they always made it a point that the person who helped uh, arrange this video conference on FaceTime uh, was someone that uh, he, he knew, even though he knew the staff were really struggling with, um, with staffing and, 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 and challenges as it was, it was a run, running rampant through the facilities. And of course, the time was no longer an hour, but it was, you know, a few minutes, okay. And um, at the end, um, you know, this nursing home, that was a five-star nursing home, it was on the front page of the Globe, uh, you know, 10 days ago, uh, and, and where it was just plastered, um, and he felt it was terribly unfair. Um, he knew the care there was really excellent, uh, delivered by the caregivers, the front line who, who were, unbelievably patient, uh, working with many patients, uh, residents with advanced Alzheimer's, very respectful of older adults. They were very authentic. And he was always like, how the heck can these guys do this on the wages that they're making? And, uh, you know, uh, uh, when, uh, when, the, uh, when his mother passed away, uh, one of the staff, uh, the aides that he was, you know, basically said, you know, um, uh, it, when I go into that dining hall now, I could always rely on your mother's eyes lighting up. And I'm not going to have that anymore. I'm not going to have that anymore. So um, that was just kind of like, a, 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 so I'm going to just talk very little about, uh, briefly about the, this nursing home long-term care population. And just the one primer here is, um, you know, nursing homes, they're buildings, but inside those buildings, there's actually two types of care being delivered in some ways. On, on one part is the long-term care nursing home, and actually people who are there, like my friend's mother, they're called residents. They're actually not called patients, okay? The other side are SNFs. They're the short-stay post-acute skilled nursing, and it, these are short-stay, um, and they are referred to as patients, but it's all happening within the same building. But in a nursing home, average size of a nursing home is about 100, 100 beds. And about 87% are these uh, residents who live there. And then about 10 to 15% are the short-term SNF patients. Uh, my claim to fame at MGH, I was hired as MGH's first SNFist. Okay, so my care was really focused on more of the short-stay person. And, uh, you know, there's a little difference between the, the payer for this, uh, uh, the financial model for this. Uh, people who are living in the long-term care who are the residents, the real primary payer is Medicaid. These are their homes and it's mass health. On the short stay side, it's a medical model care paid for by Medicare, it's limited. And there's a big difference in terms of the margin that these nursing facilities have, those who are long-term care residents paid by Medicaid, um, it's a loss. Every single day, they are actually operating at a loss, but it's made up by the uh, Medicare um, uh, 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 reimbursement. That's quite lucrative, okay? Anyway, I just wanted to share that. Um, most of my work in nursing homes is on the SNF side, but this whole uh, webinar has caused me to like have a deeper new appreciation for the whole nursing home ecosystem. Well, uh, you know that uh, it, it, it's called Ground Zero, uh, uh, nursing homes Ground Zero for COVID. Um, it, it was uh, the uh, it was it came in 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 in, uh, uh, at, in the Life Care Center in Kirkland uh, in the beginning of March, um, and the, the the numbers are devastating. Um, Nursing homes, uh, uh, and this is the, these are the numbers from earlier this week. Um, looking at deaths, um, more than 10,000, 10,378 deaths in, this, in the U.S. out of all deaths uh, are in nursing homes. This is an underestimation, okay, uh, because these are only the, the states that are actually reporting deaths in nursing homes. 
in Massachusetts, you get a clearer picture, 56% of all COVID-related deaths happened in these nursing homes, 56%. And within the Massachusetts nursing homes, there's like 383 of them in Massachusetts. Um, it is rampant. 80% uh, of all nursing homes have at least one COVID and then 55% have 10 or more cases. So it's outbreaking all over the place. And just in terms of the workforce, in Massachusetts, when you look at all COVID diagnosis in Massachusetts, uh, cases that are positive, about 20% are in the long-term care nursing home workforce. So they only make up 0.6% of the whole population tested, but over 20% of those who are positive. So staggering numbers. And uh, this has not been uh, 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 um, ignored by the media. Uh, uh, COVID not only ravaged nursing homes, but also uh, media has ravaged nursing homes. And so it's a real interesting concept, like uh, the hospital ICUs are, are really portrayed as the heroes, and, and, uh, but that's not been the case for nursing homes. Um, there's articles all the time pouring out. And so um, the thing I wanted to, you know, was interesting is was, was just like, you know, ground zero, or is this really a situation of just being ground down? Every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And what's been happening in this uh, nursing home uh, sector? Uh, well, on every single level, it's been an industry or care part that has been ground down in terms of shrinking payment by MassHealth, shrinking Medicare um, payment, um, and volume uh, in the era of value-based care, uh, rising percentage of patients with dementia, rising age of nursing home residents with frailty. So now the average age is uh, over 83, whereas maybe 20 years ago, it was like just around 80. Um, the long-term care workers are disproportionately lower wage earners with limited education. Uh, they're in the bottom quartile, 40% are in the bottom quartile of wage earners. Um, increased staff vacancy rates. So this is even before COVID. They, this sector had the highest staff vacancy rate on average, and Massachusetts was in the lowest part of that. Um, the average of 20% vacancy rates uh, for staff. And uh, they even high, uh, uh, there was a high rates of infection control deficiencies, even in the high, uh, 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 high quality uh, nursing homes decreasing occupancy, lots of uh, ownership changes, and overall rising nursing home closures. About 35% uh, of all nursing homes in Massachusetts has been a shrinkage over the last 10 years. Um, so it's, it's an industry that has uh, really been uh, struggling. And on top of this comes this incredible, horrible calamity called coronavirus. So I'm going to and kind of here with uh, another you know, view of this, a view from the ground up. Um, I would say this sector, the nursing home care sector, is a place that is probably not highly valued in society and is considered probably a low trust, one of the lowest trust settings. Public health, hospitals and healthcare systems, regulators, state policymakers, you can just see that it's overall a very low trust ecosystem. Okay? Even the public, I think we would stigmatize the nursing homes uh, for those. And my friend was no exception. He did everything he could to keep his mother out of a nursing home. But what you find is in COVID, we saw this all play out in terms of nursing homes, uh, uh, we, we were interested in nursing homes as being a place that we could help with the surge and send patients who needed to be, uh, uh, to help clear out and make capacity for our hospital, okay? Well, we found that this was really hard to do. And, um, and, and I don't wanna go so much into that as a, I, I don't wanna focus the COVID talk about, you know, um, uh, you know, as, as a healthcare delivery system, but um, it was the long-term care, the surge, all the surge 
focus was in our hospitals and ICUs when it was happening right before our eyes in our nursing homes. They experienced the surge that everybody in society was trying to help prevent, but it was happening right there. And I'll explain why. Um, but I, I think um, what I'm gonna say is that public health, uh, we flatten the curve, social distancing, um, and um, the, the, what, I, what I learned is that within this, the, the ecosystem, there was the residents, the staff, and the family members. And there was, there was an am amazing community within that pod. Uh, these are places that became the last community of these residents, in their life. And um, another story I have is uh, where um, another, uh, a colleague of mine, nursing home, uh, is mother, her mother is in the nursing home. She had moderate uh, Alzheimer's, but also had physical frailty. All of the reasons why you want, why a person needs a nursing home at the end has to do with the fact that that person needs so much physical care and physical assistance that it's impossible to do other than in a nursing home. And yet that is the total opposite of what social distancing is trying to do. The, 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 the whole reason and the, and, the, and the importance of nursing home care is to take care of every little part of movement, physical touch. It requires high, 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 high touch. And that's what was taken away um, in the spirit of uh, in the call for public health and social distancing. These were communities that were just decimated. Um, and and, and uh, my, my friend would describe like these nursing homes that they lived in, the, the weekends were filled with family and people from the community bringing meals. It, 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 and, and even my friend's uh, uh, mother uh, maybe wasn't so aware uh, 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 with, with Alzheimer's but it, it made a huge difference in that community. And this was just decimated. Um, and uh, COVID um, uh, ripped through and staff, many of them ended up um, um, uh, being sick. And, and the staff, I'd say there was kind of like, you know, two types, those who were, uh, well, everyone was scared, but there were those who basically said, no, I'm leaving, this is not, I, I, this is not worth it. But there were many, many, many staff these aides who soldiered through despite everything. And, and these nursing homes were incredibly low resource with PPEs and diagnostic testing. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kimberly is talking about, you know, just in terms of like the, how it, it was just these policies were just didn't, they, they could not be executed at all in, in, the, in these settings that were so lowly resourced already. So just imagine, a nursing home that had vacancy rates of 18% to begin with. And then um, on top of COVID, uh, they, they would uh, double that amount within a day. So um, I, I think that um, uh, uh, this, this uh, community uh, was really eye-opening for me uh, because I, even as a doctor, I'd say I was not really all as much in this daily community aspect of what was happening in these nursing homes. And just to close, I think, you know, we're gonna talk about this afterwards, like the short term, long term. Um, I think uh, just a couple questions here, short term, you know, this has unmasked, this is, unma I'm hoping that this is unmasked, we're, we're needing masks, but I'm hoping that this whole uh, unmasking of this, uh, uh, um, devastation of a long-term care with COVID uh, will uh, cause society to take a long pause. You know, what, what does a higher trust setting look like? What does higher value look like? And as a, as a gerontologist, um, I'll just say that aging, aging is actually a very, very new phenomenon for history in our society. Um, it's, it's been a recent phenomenon and just in the last 150 years. We are seeing the effects of aging and all the successes of our medical care system. And uh, it's gonna be something we have to reckon with as a society. Uh, 
So how will we uh, live well and strong into our last uh, years of life? And, and so I'm hoping that this will be a longer term question of resetting and looking at our priorities um, um, because our society just continues to age with greater and greater percentage uh, for the next 30, 40 years. So anyway, with that, I think I'm gonna just um, um, hand it over to the next speaker, but thank you for your time. Thank you, Chuck, that was, that was great. Um... I had, I had these experiences with my late wife, Joan, and I, everything you've said resonates so strongly. Hey Chuck, that was really powerful. And we often focus here on various meetings. We ascribe the various types of illnesses and patients with those illnesses, but you really draw our attention to the meetings we ascribe to various forms of caregivers and the consequences of those meetings as well. So, so thank you very much. Um, and next we're gonna turn to not only a, a leading pulmonologist and researcher on, on respiratory disease, but uh, someone who has actually experienced COVID-19 and is in a unique situation to help, help us um, uh, he hear about the, the lived experience of COVID-19. So, so Dr. Ed Nardell, Ed. Uh, thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks, Arthur, for the invitation. I'm usually um, uh, showing slides and talking about uh, data or uh, teaching about something. Um, but now I'm asked to talk about my own experience, and that uh, feels quite different. Um, I do want to say that I've really enjoyed the presentations, and I hope we do have enough time for discussions. I have written down questions or comments for Catherine, for Charles, and for Kim. So um, I, I'm, I've actually been doing some uh, nursing home visits uh, for the Mass Department of Public Health, and I, it, with an eye to mitigation, and uh, many of the things that Charles just said uh, really resonate. So um, where to begin? Well, um, I believe that I was infected with COVID, not at work, but in my pastimes uh, in the middle of um, uh, March. Uh, on uh, March 12th, uh, we were all aware of, of COVID, but we had this sense that we were ahead of the curve. And partly that sense of being ahead of the curve was there was so little testing uh, around that we really had no idea what was happening. I, I kept saying, well, if there was a lot of COVID, I, I knew that the Brigham at the time, I believe, had not admitted a COVID patient. So you would think that if there were COVID happening and people got very sick, that a place like the Brigham would be already seeing them. So on the 12th, a Sunday, uh, I joined friends and we went to community theater. We are all bumping elbows and uh, being uh, talking about COVID and being very careful, but the theater was packed. And uh, you know, we and that evening I hosted a, a wonderful uh, soprano uh, concert at uh, Longwood Towers where I have regular uh, concerts in our big lobby. And again, we bumped elbows and we uh, were very careful, but we were certainly um, violating any current um, social distancing norm. Uh, that week, uh, our, I belonged to a chorus, and that will come up as a, uh, an important point. Uh, I belonged to a chorus, and uh, that week, the technical rehearsal for an upcoming concert was, was canceled because we were 200 uh, in the chorus. And so that evening, uh, a partner and I went to, um, to a local piano bar and again, there was um, this hand disinfectant at the entrance, and we um, thought we were being very careful. There were only 11 people in the in the piano bar area, and um, sang open mic uh, as I like to do. And um, we literally were disinfecting the microphone with uh, Clorox between singers, and 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 then basically that was the last social event that that I did. And that following weekend, I started getting um, what I thought was some uh, spring allergy symptoms, uh, not atypical. Um, and by the following, uh, by the end of that following week, I was totally exhausted. I, I again attributed this to allergy. You know, it's, it's really remarkable how bad a physician we are when we're, involved, when we're the patient as well. Uh, so I, you know, I've had spring allergies many times. I was never that exhausted. 
So um, literally hard to get out of bed. And in fact, I was supposed to go down to Rhode Island where my partner lives and uh, I had all I could do to do it, but I did it. And uh, so I managed to, and I, I just wanted to sleep. I had no fever. Uh, I had a minimal cough. And then that Sunday I drove back for a, a conference call um, and after that conference call, again, I had, had been having shaking chills without fever. Again, rather atypical for uh, spring allergies, but um, denial um, reigns. And so uh, and then I had a fever of 103. And um, the remarkable thing is I'm 73 and um, so certainly at high risk for a bad outcome. And so starting with that Sunday, um, with fever 103, I um, contacted my doctor and started taking Tylenol and drinking a lot of fluids. And Tylenol was not touching this fever. I, uh, I basically was about 103 every night and it would be that pattern. Afternoon, starting with a fever, evening, and then the fever would break. I'd sweat a lot and I was actually able to sleep pretty well. Um, then uh, my doctor suggested I maybe take a non-steroidal. Now, if you remember early in this from the China experience, uh, there was thought to be a lot of people who died of COVID were taking ibuprofen and it was really not recommended. But my infectious disease colleagues and uh, my doctor said there was really no good evidence that that was the case. So I started taking naproxen and from the do first dose of naproxen, just uh, I'm not I'm not being President Trump and uh, advertising any particular drug, but from the first dose of naproxen, I never had a fever again, and started feeling progressively better after three days of, of fever, and and that progressed um, to feeling perfectly well. Uh, I did have lung involvement. I know that not because I was short of breath. I did I did have a. a handy dandy uh, finger oximeter at home as a pulmonologist. Doesn't everyone have one? And um, so um, I, I took my oxygen saturation and whereas it should be 95 or so, I was around more like um, uh, 92, 93. And then one day feeling particularly well in the first few days uh, coming out of the shower, I said, I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm going to take my oxygen saturation now that I'm up and not sitting in a chair and it's going to be terrific. And it was 89, which corresponds to a PO2 of under 60. Um, again, not short of breath particularly. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that of course uh, that weekend uh, in, um, in Providence, I had brought a couple of bottles of nice wine and uh, we had dinner and I couldn't taste anything. That should have been a clue, but that, that, that information was not, uh, yet widely uh, spread. I, I couldn't taste the wine, I couldn't taste the food, but, and, and quite unusual. But anyway, uh, I, I, had, I, I had lung involvement. And again, thank goodness, I, um, I, I continued to get better. Now I have to say, oh, I was tested on the 23rd of March. And uh, as a healthcare worker, it was very easy to get tested at the Brigham drive-through. And I got the call back the next day that it was positive. Um, not surprising, or actually, I, I take that back. It took about seven days. That first uh, uh, test uh, was not very quick. Um, in fact, it wasn't long after that that I had another test, which was positive, um, thinking that it would already be negative by then. I've subsequently tested ne twice negative, and the process has become um, much quicker uh, to get tested. But the um, I wanted to mention a couple things. Number one is that with that very first test, naturally going through my mind is I've got COVID, I'm 73, uh, and th this could be very serious. Um, as it turned out, my wife, my wife, my, my daughter was about to give uh, uh, birth to my first grandchild. And in fact, she did on the 29th. I was tested on 23rd at the Brigham. And I'm thinking I'm never going to see this child. So, um, uh, but as I've already relayed, uh, so there was a great deal of fear and uh, anxiety about what was going to happen and absolute uh, surprise and delight that it was rel relatively well tolerated. You know, um, I don't want to get into medicine here particularly, 
but there is some suggestion that the root of uh, transmission matters. And I believe I infected um, my partner uh, who got a GI, minimal GI symptoms and never developed a fever and um, did very well. If you look at the literature from Wuhan, that was the case. Uh, if you get pharyngeal involvement first, you may actually have a more orchestrated immune response. Um, but if you get it in the lung directly, that may be uh, a, a lead to a much more uh, uh, vigorous um, Im immune response. So I, I actually, um, because I belong to this chorus, and in that course are people of all ages, including other people my age or older. I wrote up my um, experience um, because all you saw on, on television was the horrible outcomes of New York City and Italy. Uh, people, if you got positive COVID and you're over 65 or 70, you are going to be likely in the intensive care unit and on a ventilator. And, and, and of course, there is far too much of that, especially from the nursing homes. But um, I wanted my friends to know that, uh, and anyone else who wanted to know about it, that there, it, it isn't automatic. And in fact, those outcomes are probably even still very much the, um, the minority, even, even at, uh, in my age group. And of course, uh, but of course it, it, it does happen and happens too often. Uh, that little write-up called, uh, what's it like to have, so, so what's it like to have COVID, I'll tell you, actually it got wide circulation. Um, again, there weren't that many reports of people who done well and even was translated and sent back to China. So someone asked permission to do that. So uh, pretty much uh, I think that's, um, oh, one other thing that uh, I think is stigma. And I've been involved in tuberculosis for all of my life and well aware of the stigma issue. I, I live in a, in a condominium, large condominium complex, and in fact was on the, on the board uh, for, for a long time. And the day that I went to get tested, I called and, you know, my, my car was waiting. Um, we decided where I'd park afterwards and how I would uh, uh, get back in. So people in the building knew that I, uh, I was going to be tested for COVID. And then um, the, the, the condominium lawyer uh, recommended that, um, that the building be notified that there was a COVID patient in the complex. And, you know, I, I, I actually strongly objected to that, not, not because of my own, I told this story to lots of people, but I thought that what good was this going to do? People are already uh, terrified of, of COVID. I could imagine people, you know, clearing out of the hallway as I uh, approached, even though I knew that soon I was gonna be the only safe person they knew um, but um, because I had already been post COVID, but they did it anyway. And I, I continued to object that this served no, it, the purpose it served, I think was liability. As if no one was aware of COVID, they didn't want anyone to come and say, what, what, there was a COVID person in the building and you didn't tell us? This building is filled of, with, uh, it's near the Longwood Medical Area and is full of healthcare workers. Uh, who live here. So I'm sure I'm not the only COVID uh, patient that lives here, but I do think that, and I was reminded of this, of course, by the sign that, uh, that um, Kim showed of the uh, um, building supervisor or uh, super who um, was very prominently displayed as, a, uh, as Typhoid Mary in that particular building. We do need to be aware of, um, of infectious cases, et cetera. But I do think that um, uh, you know there are aspects of uh, stigma for this disease also. That in fact, it's kind of good that everybody wears face coverings now, and that it, it's sort of been an equalizer. And I have to say that this disease itself, um, within um, boundaries, has been a great equalizer. There's no doubt that the Prime Minister of England could have had a bad outcome as well, uh, and didn't and everyone virtually is um, vulnerable. Admittedly, it's a lot harder to self-isolate uh, in a uh, crowded apartment building or in a, a, a home full of people, a, a 
a nursing home than it is in you know a, a luxury apartment building uh, uh, it, in Boston. So I'm, I'm again very grateful that it's been very easy to be isolated here. But you know this uh, this experience is. Um, I think the other thing is about, uh, and I want to say, and I'll stop, uh, is that the outcomes of this disease are so unpredictable and so varied from the children we just talked about who have virtually nothing to many people who have asymptomatic uh, or low symptomatic cases, including some older people. Uh, I was, uh, I'm aware of a, I believe a, well, among the homeless, um, uh, Jim O'Connell reported on the news that of a hundred, I think, homeless people who were tested, 30 tested possible, not, not one of them had a symptom. Now you would think that that would be an incredibly vulnerable population and for whatever reason. How do we explain in some countries that they're just recording one or two deaths? Um, and, uh, you know, with inexplicable differences between what's happened here and has happened in Europe and other places. So that's the mystery, I think, and, and it's very frightening because you really don't know what you're in store for uh, when, you, when you get this diagnosis. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Ed. That, that was a really good view from the inside of the experience of the, of the disease. I really appreciate it. Well, I did want to show uh, one little thing uh, I, that I forgot. I'm going to share my screen for just one second. And you'll see my what what is my, on my screen. So baby was born, oh, and, oh, and, oh. and this is Enzo on his father's uh, chest, and he's he's doing quite well. Now, how do I get out of here? Let's see, Un, unshare screen. I don't know how to do that. Can, can somebody do that? I don't know. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Great. That was nice. Yes, that was, uh, thank you. It's like watching a movie where you know the person who lives at the end of the story. And so we were able to smile along with you. But when, yeah. I, heard the, when I heard the 89% Rumer sats, it's, it's a little nervous there, but glad yeah. to see you there. So yeah. Thank you very much. And now we'll, 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 we'll turn to, to Gene Richardson, uh, yet another esteemed medical anthropologist who will talk about COVID in the context of prior pandemics and what we can learn from all of this. Gene. So much. Hold on. There it is. Okay. All good? You can see the slides? Gene, all good. All right, great. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, this has been, uh, you know, true to the varieties of, of uh, COVID experience we've heard um, from many different areas. Um, what I want to talk about is some of the parallels with the uh, Ebola outbreak, but then get into uh, a bit, a few slides about uh, my research, which is essentially on how in William James pragmatist fashion, how our experiences are shaped and, and how the truths we come to are, are shaped not only by what we've experienced, but um, by academic disciplines as well. So I'm just gonna run through some pictures, some parallels. Uh, here were the varieties of my experience. Uh, you know, the first one on the left is the Ebola kit. Um, the, and that was in, uh, or that was training uh, for the Sierra Leone mission. The middle one was our DRC uh, Congo kit uh, because of the armed violence there. And then on the right, I didn't have a picture, but this is what we wore exactly at the Brigham, the yellow gown, the purple nitrile gloves, the N95 respirator with the, uh, uh, with the face shield. And uh, I must say, yeah, the, the Brigham epidemiologist did a very good job of, of organizing uh, supplies and, and further down the road, uh, decontamination of masks. Uh, so story starts back in 2014 in Sierra Leone. This is what containment of Ebola virus looked like as far as alerts. Um, you could call this number 117. And uh, like um, Kim was talking about, she, she was manning the, 
for womaning the the phone lines for for COVID in New York. This is what the phone lines look like in Freetown. Uh, you could call a number and report either a death or somebody with symptoms. And that information uh, would be sent down to a district Ebola response center. At the Brigham, we had we have the bio threats pager. I did not name it. Um, when I was on, let's see, in mid-March or early March, the, there was the, there was one bio threats pager and within, and that person, the I, uh, an ID faculty member dedicated to just this pager, I think they reported 600 pages in a day. So uh, it then moved to four pagers and they were still up all day and all night um, fielding pages. And this was in addition to the partner's hotline. So um, a lot of you know, parallels into, you know, as far as uh, communication during epidemics and, and what that looks like. Um, in Sierra Leone, once the call was made, the information would be routed to this district Ebola response center where there was an alert desk and case management desks, um, contact tracing, all of that. And these were organized by uh, the British military along with the uh, Ministry of Health and NGOs. At the Brigham, we have the Brigham Incident Command Team. Um, so, you know, not really that more high tech, just um, uh, air conditioning is the main difference. And alerts in Sierra Leone, we would send out an ambulance uh, to, um, to find suspect cases and, you know, bring them for isolation, treatment. Uh, and testing. Um, so we'd put on the PPE, the person would be brought in the ambulance. Um, here's an ambulance from Boston. So similarly, people dressing up in P PPE and bringing the patient for testing, isolation, and treatment. Um, safe and dignified burials were an important part of containment in West Africa. Um, uh, notably because corpses were very infectious. Uh, here's pictures from New York, what uh, the burials or uh, at least preparation of corpses look like. So on the left, you have a forklift loading bodies into a refrigerated truck. And then on the right is the refrigerated truck with um, bodies. Uh, here's a graveyard outside one of the Ebola treatment units in Sierra Leone. And here's a, a graveyard on one of the islands offside of, uh, or in New York for patients that don't have uh, family that claim them. Here we are doing uh, some village sweeps and uh, contact tracing in uh, Sierra Leone village. And that's one notable difference with the uh, outbreak of COVID in the U.S. is that there really uh, wasn't any contact tracing um, until uh, Partners in Health and the Massachusetts government started um, their community tracing collaborative. And I'll point out the, the spectacles <laughs> that are missing an arm <laughs> on our esteemed professor. <laughs> um, here's what one of the big Ebola treatment units look like um, in Sierra Leone. And here is Boston Heart uh, Hospital that's at the Boston Convention Center. Here's one of our, uh, part of our work in Partners in Health in West Africa was developing these uh, community care centers, which are, um, you know, decentralized 12 bed units that were spread out through rural areas to uh, bring care closer to uh, people suffering from Ebola. Here is the community care center, quote unquote, in Cambridge. So this is, I guess, the gym of a, a, a high school, which Harvard has paid to set this up, um, uh, basically an open air um, housing or shelter for the homeless, but there's also supposed to be isolation for people with symptoms. I don't know, I might rather be in one of these tents. Um, some comparisons with uh, DRC. So we do have a vaccine uh, for Ebola. 
Um, we're working on a vaccine for COVID, but there's al already coloniality has reared its head with um, the French doctors talking about testing vaccines on Africans. Um, and this touched a big nerve, you know, throughout the world, but especially in DRC where uh, it was only, you know, 80, 70 years ago that the uh, French colonialists were testing their um, sleeping sickness uh, treatments on, on people, which, you know, 10% would go blind just from the, the treatment alone. So there's a parallel still in 2020. Diagnostics for um, Ebola were somewhat revolutionized by uh, these uh, portable tests, the uh, gene expert cartridges, which allowed us to basically do the test at, at local units instead of um, um, Ed's experience essentially of waiting six, seven days for a test to come back. I mean, that, that was 2014 Ebola in Sierra Leone. We also had to wait seven days. So, you, you know, see the parallel with the, one of the poorest countries in the world and, and one of the richest countries in the world. When I was on service in March, um, one of our fellows got sick and our ID fellows got sick and he was sent home uh, to self-isolate. And he was put in a queue and I think it took him four days to finally come get the, uh, get the test. And then it was another two days before we had the results. Uh, now everything is much quicker. Um, and they're using gene expert now at the Brigham for uh, ultra rapid diagnosis for people that, you know, are undomiciled or, you know, where uh, they want a, uh, a result quicker than 24 hours. Uh, because of the patient situation. Um, and, you know, these would be of use throughout the world. Um, but as you can see here, the, you know, these supplies from masks to Cepheid expert cartridges are in short supply and, and poorer countries are getting outbid. So I've been seconded to the Africa CDC in Addis Ababa and the first Thing they asked to help with was getting supplies um, and so it's it is a uh, it's true the that um, I think uh, Dr. John Kengasam just wrote an article in Nature maybe yesterday saying that look we have they actually have the money <laughs> they they received a lot of funding and they can't buy things because they're either being outbid or outmaneuvered I know Israel uh, was using Mossad to help um, uh, get ventilators and tests, and that, that's you know well described in the uh, media. And so, uh, this uh, you know the theme is that uh, the coloniality uh, of not only knowledge pro production, which we'll get to, but just resource allocation is still uh, alive and well. Here we are doing some um, uh, sensitization campaign in uh, DRC about trying to get people to uh, take the vaccine and to do some contact tracing. And we could actually do this from house to house or hut to hut. Where contact tracing is different in the US is that it's mostly done by phone. And here's one of the UMass Lowell students who's, who is one of the Massachusetts contact tracers doing his work via phone. All right, so to get to um, my spiel, um, and here's a quote from William James about, there can be no final truth in ethics any more than in physics until the last human has had their experience and said their say. Uh, and what I work on um, is essentially how our, our understanding of the phenomena around us, uh, what we hold as truth is actually um, shaped to a, a strong degree by, um, by academic work. And for epidemics, um, that those truths are shaped by epidemiologists. Um, a little more on pragmatism. It views social reality as being constantly in flux, knowledge as relative and shaped by multiple instrument and instrumentalist goals. Society as a form of discursive interaction, the self as a, biologic, a biographical project free of metaphysical baggage. Science as will to meaning and power, and methodology as a form of situated inquiry. And then critical pragmatists, and this is well described in, um, uh, in Arthur's pre previous book on um, uh, passion for society. Um, 
They supplement this with a view and an emphasis on the construction of reality as a struggle between conflicting discourses and competing definitions of the situation. And I've been writing recently on uh, the mathematical models of, of the pandemic. Um, I, I hold that they are merely fables dressed in formal language. Um, and that doesn't mean that they're a bad thing. It means we just have to understand what their epistemic value is. I think that they often serve not necessarily as forecasts, but for means for setting epistemic confines to the understanding of why some groups live sicker lives than others. These confines can sustain predatory accumulation rather than challenge it. And I have an, ar uh, an article in BMJ Global Health two weeks ago called Pandemicity, um, and uh, which we might conceive of as the linking of humanity, humanity through contagion. Will this bring about a dawning of relational consciousness in the descending descendants of colonialists in the global north, or will it further the retreat into xenophobia, fascism, uh, and necropolitics? And you can look at that article um, if you're interested. Um, so here's what I'm talking about with fables. So interestingly, the same group that's in the uh, in the news right now, the Stanford group for publishing that Santa Clara study, which was, I think, um, very dangerous and and now it seems unethical because of the way that they um, recruit, pay, uh, recruited participants. Here was one of that group's previous models on uh, direct aid, uh, essentially like USAID payments to Africa, showing that it raised um, uh, health indicators across the board. So very like, you know, supporting the neoliberal um, model of you know, continue free markets as they are and use aid to dress up health inequalities. And I basically took their model and just added one variable, uh, illicit fin financial flows. And here's what illicit financial flows are. Uh, in 2017, $160 billion went into the continent of Africa in the form of uh, aid, uh, loans and remittances and $203 billion came out in Illicit financial flows, not repatriation of profits, illegal flows. So tax evasion, resource theft, and this thing called uh, trade misinvoicing. So, you know, the idea that there is even a U.S. A uh, agency for international development is a farce. The continent is developing us in 2017 to, as a net creditor um, of $40 billion. And so here's where I'll talk about uh, quick, the last few slides, uh, what I mean by setting epistemic confines to our understanding uh, of, of outbreak phenomena. My, my thesis, one of my thesis advisors at Stanford would say, well, don't conflate uh, you know, infectious disease modelers with the economists because our, our, um, uh, our models are far falsifiable. Like we can see which one was closer you know, they, to the actual truth of, of the outbreak. If I say, one million people across the world would uh, um, die, and in a year, one million people died. Then my my outbreak or my forecast was true. It was a good predictor, and my response to that would be, you're you're modeling a future that is constructed. So if for you only COVID matters, and um, and you get to that you know million deaths, then you, you're aiming for this narrow view of, of what actually matters. And this is what the Imperial model does. This is from Imperial College London, where they say, all right, an unmitigated epidemic um, pandemic would cause 40 million deaths all the way down to uh, highly suppressive measures would get us down to a million. What if the question were not just COVID, but all global infectious disease deaths? Like let's like actually expand what, um, what the, epidemiologists are tasked with, um, uh, you know, talking about interventions for. And so I moved to the third uh, bar in the, in the previous graph, mitigation of COVID only, which would cause 20 million deaths down to the uh, enhanced suppression of uh, COVID getting us to 10 million deaths. Now this is adding the 9 million deaths from infectious diseases, preventable infectious diseases. Um, and you know, adding debt cancellation or radical wealth distribution to these models to show that we could actually get to a million deaths from COVID plus preventable infectious disease 
across the world if we add radical wealth distribution to just this COVID model. So why is it that only um, COVID gets the global um, the public health plan and the huge public uh, investment? It's because it it infects the uh, you know mostly the global north because it 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 uh, it affects uh, those that are that are running the show. And if all if humans had equal worth then this would probably be on the agenda. And this is what models can look like. And as such, we're actually working on a model right now that shows, um, takes the New York outbreak and shows if black Americans had received reparations, what would the New York City outbreak look like? And it's very different. Um, and hopefully that'll be out in the next few weeks. Um, and here's the two combined. I can uh, send this to you if you're interested, but I figured it's good time to get to Q uh, discussion Q and A. So thanks very much. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Gene. Again, for as always, puncturing our our hubris or our smugness and expanding how we think about these. Um, all five of you were eloquent, and th th these were really remarkable talks. That each added a different perspective to certainly how I, I've understood how the COVID experience um, has been felt in, in, in so many ways. Um, I'll speak very briefly. Um, because when I'm not wearing my uh, executive producer hat for these webinar series, uh, I, I do primary care and mass general. And when Arthur had mentioned these notions of vulnerability and threat, it, it brought uh, uh, uncertainty and threat. It brought up the related notion of vulnerability. And as co this course has been reinforced by a series of talks we've just heard. And they mixed with the sense of shared crisis and an all hands on deck approach to task sharing and redeployment at MGH across the hospital. It's forced the transformation of primary care practice that goes beyond the shift to telemedicine. Uh, I now have my patients calling me, texting me on my cell phone who would normally have gone um, through our excellent nursing staff all over in Longwood. And I suspect that many of us in primary care wonder what the new normal will, will look like, not only with respect to practice reconfiguration around telemedicine and, and home visits, especially now that we see again the obvious advantages of seeing our patients in situ, but also given that our patients are always vulnerable to some extent, and we're always all in this together, how will we configure our behaviors, practice patterns, and medical identities moving forward? Um, I should note that a long-standing North Star for all of us in primary care has been John Stokel, who died a week ago from COVID-19 at the age of 97. Dr. Stokel was not only one of the inventors of modern primary care, as it were, turned all of our attention to the intimacy and intricacies of the clinical encounter. My generation of, of trainees and clinicians grew up on his and the likewise wonderful and late Andy Billings 1989 textbook, The Clinical Encounter. And, and given that I'm home, I happen to have it on my shelf. Um, in, in their preface, Billings and Stokel write that, quote, the interview is not simply an interpersonal communication skill or technique but a meeting of persons full of emotions, attachments, ideologies, values, rights, duties, politics, and conflicts, a relationship that is central to the physician's therapeutic and moral responsibility to patients, unquote. With COVID-19 and primary care, everything's still more intense and in focus. Heightening our attention to these relationships and activities, we'll see what the long-term impact is for patients and clinicians alike. In their acknowledgments, it's no accident that Billings and Stokel particularly thanked a number of our department's faculty members, including the late Leon Eisenberg, but also Alan Brandt, Mary Jo and Byron Good, and of course, Arthur Kleinman. So I'll next turn it over to Arthur again before we hear from Paul and have a more general discussion. Arthur. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and thank you, thank you to all the presenters. It, it was a extraordinary set of presentations that covered so many dimensions. It's really hard to summarize, and I'm not sure that summary is in fact the way, the best way to proceed. I'd like to sort of take an aperçu uh, approach where we just look at certain points. So in, the, in a recent issue of, um, I think it was the New Yorker, but it may have been the New Yorker Review of Books, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, the author of the uh, Emperor of All Maladies about cancer and of the gene, um, uh, took on uh, COVID. And he did it in a very interesting way. 
in the United States. He did it by looking first at a disaster that happened in Japan to a company that was contracted to um, Toyota to make a very small part of uh, all Toyota automobiles. The, the good news was it was a small part. The bad news was it was in every single one of the Toyota automobiles and they could not work without it. There was an explosion at this factory and um, Toyota in days realized that they were going to have to stop production totally all over the world unless they dealt with this. And they figured out amazingly in a matter of uh, weeks how to overcome this by repurposing um, uh, some uh, aspect of their supply chain. Um, uh, Sid Mukherjee used this to critique the American response to COVID um, with respect to our entire manufacturing system, uh, pointing out that there was no, that the enormous emphasis on efficiency and the use of just on time supply chain meant that there was no slack in, in our system. And so that when the CDC had its initial disaster in producing tests, there was no way that this could quickly be remedied. And he used it then to critique what I think historians, <laughs> Scott is the historian, I'm the anthropologist, but I think historians of the future will, will recognize that this, the way we have handled COVID can only be described as a catastrophe, as one of the great American catastrophes. And that it has opened all of our eyes, not just to the dangers of this virus and to the brokenness of our healthcare system, but to actually the brokenness of governance in our society, of institutions in our society. And of course, into the unacceptable uh, level of, um, of vulnerability uh, simply based on social difference. Um, and I think that we can parallel that in a way with the kind of discussion that occurred here uh, today. So one of the extraordinary things I think we've seen is the work of doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, nursing aides at the front line. But we've learned something else, haven't we, from COVID? We've learned the front line is not just health professionals. The front line is people in the Central Valley of California producing our uh, tomatoes and lettuce. Um, workers in the middle of the United States who are producing our meats, et cetera. Um, uh, not just the EMTs, but the delivery men uh, who make it possible for us, those of us who have the resources to really shelter at home in a totally different way than those who are really extraordinarily vulnerable. Um, we've come to realize that um, when we talk about health, it also includes social care. In fact, um, uh, um, we've heard this from our present presenters today, but it's best illustrated in the UK. In the UK, they do not count their, um, uh, their nursing homes and their assisted living uh, as part of the broader healthcare system. It's not part of the NHS. The NHS relates to it but it's called the social care system. And it's funded in a, in a, in a, in a separate and, and parallel, parallel way. And what we have seen here is the breakdown of our social care system, um, um, an extraordinary uh, uh, breakdown. And I think uh, it makes, as I said at the beginning, visible how important care is. And, and every one of the presentations uh, made this point 
magnificently um, that that when we now are able, if we're able to do what Chuck has recommended, that is sort of think about things in the long term in a reset mode, how will we reset this? Um, uh, hopefully, we'll reset things by recognizing that care is as central to our society as economics is. That it isn't just the economics of care that makes care matter, but it's care that makes economics matter. And that in, in, if we're going to rethink things, I think this is an extraordinarily important way to begin that rethinking. And so as we rethink things, it might be best before we become optimistic to be a little pessimistic. Uh, um, and let me just build on some of the things we've heard to raise some concerns on the pessimistic uh, side. So one of the things we heard is that um, what COVID makes kind of special is that physicians are not touching patients. Nurses are probably doing relatively little of that. It's the nurses aides who are doing probably most of that kind of work. And even they are restricted in what, what they're doing. That, I was thinking of John Stokel. John Stokel, who was the epitome of primary care in medicine, was also the epitome of the patient-doctor relationship in medicine. Always pointed out the central role of touching the patient. Uh, that the information one got was, yes, useful, if you could auscultate and, 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 and get the blood pressure right and the like, but that more important in his view than all of that, because you had the machines that would be doing that as well, was that you were making contact with the patient. You were there for them. You were signaling morally the solidarity with them, emotionally the support with them, and practically you were there to make iter iterative changes as you saw clinical things develop very quickly. So that we know that care is in part responsible for who lives and who dies. The quality of care that we're now realizing from around the world um, has a tremendous influence on this. Do you have supportive measures like intravenous? Of course, we're aware of the difference between Africa in that regard and the United States. But we now realize is that Chinese doctors early on came to recognize the importance of having some patients prone because it opened up more of the lung space for respiration. We know that um, uh, uh, European physicians have made certain changes in the way that oxygen was administered without, without deciding that maybe intubation itself would become a problem in care. All those things are what are going through the minds of practitioners and nurses in the ICUs, in the, um, in the emergency rooms. And that process involves close contact with people. It involves speaking to them, hearing what they have to say. And so are we headed to a world that's going to change radically in this way? And my pessimistic, minor pessimism at the beginning is perhaps we are. We already know that from uh, uh, very close examinations of what uh, physicians do, that increasingly residents have become inconfident in their physical exams and don't do a physical exam or do a partial physical exam because they feel that they have, they can get the information from a variety of, of machines, from scans through to oximeters, et cetera, that they don't necessarily need to do a physical exam. And plus, when they want to auscultate, they realize that they don't do as well as, one, as, what, what, as what technology can tell them. Um, will this mean that telemedicine, which we've discovered is so useful in this crisis, that telemedicine will now become the way that we do things, that we'll be doing things increasingly from medicine at a distance. The distance protecting the physician and nurse from infection, but also generating a, uh, a, 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 a 
block, a blockage, a barrier in, uh, that, that doesn't allow the voice of patients, the presence of families to have the kind of influence that they can have. We've seen from just the stories that Kim gave, Kim Su, uh, how incredibly difficult it is to practice right now in the dangerous setting of COVID. But looking toward the future, when we are beyond COVID, um, will we also have changed the practices that we've made so that we've introduced a greater distance in, into things? Um, I think you can carry that out on, on multiple levels. Take the categories that, that, um, that uh, uh, we just heard Jean Richardson critique. Um, uh, uh, Chris Murray uh, was once a student of mine, or, or I should say, when he was a Harvard medical student, I tried to have some influence on him, but I, I think I failed. But I, I do appreciate Chris in many, in many, many ways. But I think that, that um, uh, he's trying to build models that are very important models for us without recognizing how values are built into those models. And that's what Gene is telling us, that the values are built into the very models that we're using uh, now. I thought that um, Ed did a great job, just a brilliant job of presenting what the, what the experience of, of COVID is. So he, Ed, thank God, um, had a, a easy time through this, but he had the fear, the, the sense that, gee, maybe I'm not gonna see my grandchild when I, when I, when I, come, when I come out of this. He, he was in, even in the almost splendid isolation that, that he had in a, in, in a, in a high level um, uh, 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 condominium, um, he, he still had this, this, this sense of, of, of fear, of, of vulnerability, of uncertainty that um, Scott mentioned earlier. I've, I, I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal um, about my experience of isolating, uh, that actually social isolation for me, because I have all the resources and I don't, and I'm not, and I'm not sick with the, with the disease, was a, was a time of, of many gains of things. But it brings out that, also that enormous discrepancy between socially isolating on Rikers Island or soci socially isolating in a poor community in remote Queens from downtown Mid Midtown Manhattan, et cetera, where my uh, grandkids are, um, or some, two of them are. So the negative, the, the, uh, the pessimistic part of this is about um, um, all the things that may still be wrong and go wrong and that will just slide back into the situation that we have, or maybe even COVID-19 could make certain things worse. But let's look at the more positive way. And I think that's the way and to, to, to bring this toward Paul's comments and, and ending is, um, uh, I think there's something enormously important about what's happening in our society vis-a-vis -vis the visibility of this problem. Because it is the, the fear of infection and the vulnerability biologically is universal. The presentations are there routinely in our media all over the place. So it's become unavoidable to see the kinds of things we're talking about. Maybe not with the depth of analysis we've heard people present or with the ability to unpack it into, its, um, into the uh, determinants that are so clear to us, the social determinants, but surely the pictures are there. So that maybe COVID-19 has this possibility for us to talk finally, not just about so of public health and improving public health, but about social care. And that's the way I would end my comments, by saying that uh, the social medicine uh, introduces the idea of social care, that we're here not just to control 
and prevent diseases, but also to strengthen, improve, reform, uh, uh, generalize the caring processes that can be uh, improved and more effectively dealt with. I find it extraordinary what Chuck showed to us of the um, separation of people dying in a nursing home and their families outside unable to be with them at that particular time. My wife was in a nursing home. I can't imagine myself, uh, her dying from COVID and me not being there with her in, in that kind of setting. And I think that will have a, an effect on making more visible the problems uh, in our nursing home system. The fact that long-term care is absent for most of us, for most people who can't afford it, that's the vast majority of Americans and the need, the need for it. So my optimism comes out of seeing all of these pictures come together in the idea of social care. Social care for the vulnerable populations, what we heard from Kim, Sue, what we've heard from Katie, what we've heard from others, these um, extraordinary vulnerabilities, but social care for all of us and our contribution to it. And I hope that in future, we can do three things to support this. One, we can do further um, varieties of COVID experiences just to even go beyond the ones that we've had uh, and, uh, and show the vast numbers of ways that people are experiencing these this time. Secondly, that we can make social care an actual policy relevant approach and think about how, how we might do this in a way that's parallel to, but so different from the way that health policy is, con is, is conducted. And third, that this will have an effect academically on the way that we do, um, we do our studies. I'll turn it back to Scott with that. Arthur, that was wonderful. And thank you for bringing it all back to, to caregiving. And we all want to share the optimistic viewpoint, but, but it certainly forces us to think through various ways this could go. So thank you very much. Um, we're now going to let Paul speak. And Paul, I'm going to open up your phone so that you can come on. That should work. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you know, usually I can be relied upon to be uh, on the optimistic side. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm struck by the ample cause for pessimism, especially when we consider, you know, the challenge that Arthur lays out, and I think Gene as well, you know, to restoring social care front and center. Unfortunately, the reports from Kimberly, Katie, and Chuck do not uh, lend themselves to any kind of uh, optimistic interpretation, uh, but they're well worth uh, considering as, as, challenge, as challenges. I, I do want to say once again that I'm going to do what Arthur said, you know, just make, instead of try to do any summary, just a couple of aperçus, you know, and thinking back to the term terminology Arthur and Joan used 20 years ago of, of local moral worlds. These are uh, each uh, remarkable presentations of local moral worlds, uh, all all of the uh, presentations. It's just that they are uh, disturbing worlds. Um, I wonder too if there's a point. This is uh, Scott. I will. Is this our seventh uh, seminar? And in any case, we've done six, quite six, a few. Six, six but it, <laughs> it's two hours, so this counts as our sixth and seventh, I think. So um, I, I was also thinking, you know, are we are we reaching this? Uh, maybe some of us are reaching breaking point. <laughs> um, I had the occasion to uh, reread the plague again. I was actually just trying to fact check something, but I read it. And um, there's a there's a line in the book about a third way a third of the way in. It's a paragraph. Um, He's just, as you'll remember, uh, Camus wrote about a fictional uh, Algerian city named Iran, uh, about 200,000 people, 
1947 to a French city in the middle of North Africa. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it, it's, it's a port city. It's got trains and planes and it gets shut down. And that's the, in a way the, the city is the, uh, the star of the, the book. But he writes, uh, at first, the fact of being cut off from the outside world was accepted with a more or less good grace much as people would have put up with any other temporary inconvenience that interfered with only a few of their habits. But now they had abruptly become aware that they were undergoing a sort of incarceration under that blue dome of sky, already beginning to sizzle in the fires of summer. They had a vague sensation that their whole lives were threatened by the present turn of events. And in the evening, when the cooler air revived their energy, this feeling of being locked in like criminals prompted them sometimes to foolhardy acts. You know, and you wonder in reading about this year long shutdown of a, a city to, to this, this is uh, the plague and, you know, both in its uh, bubonic and pneumonic forms in the, in the novel. But I, you know, I, I also wonder where we are and, uh, and, and hearing this, these reports uh, helps me situate ourselves into, again, pandemic time, uh, a, a very disturbing uh, set of reports. You know, Kim Su's report from a field hospital in Queens, Rikers, prisons, jails, talking about her supers, uh, the, the degree of fear and anxiety that she man manages to convey, um, and, and her deep understanding of, of embodied risk and vulnerability uh, I, I just uh, hope, um, Kimberly, that you continue to toggle, as you said, toggle between your experience as a doctor and an anthropologist for lots of reasons. Um, one thing that struck me as it did, um, Arthur, is the no-touch policy uh, in spite of PPE uh, is something that I think we, we haven't wrestled with uh, fully. It happened during Ebola in West Africa when there was no touch policies on top of full PPE. And, uh, you know, for a lot of clinicians, uh, West African or otherwise, um, care uh, with a no touch policy began to resemble nothing so much as no care at all. And I think that we're also facing that, not just new ways of doing care, but uh, ways of avoiding care, as, as Arthur said. Um, and by the way, I'm very sorry to hear about Dr. Stokel. Um, so thank you, Scott, for uh, uh, bring, uh, bringing him to mind. But Kim, I, I just would uh, say one of the reasons uh, to keep toggling between your experience as a doctor and an anthropologist or a critical observer is, as Arthur said, and as you've said before, we may have a chance, maybe, if we fight hard enough to dismantle some of the har harmful institutions native to uh, our society and which are certainly in uh, clear view now, but also a chance to build some more humane ones. And, uh, and <clears throat> as far as Katie's presentation goes, um, you know, I, I felt, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody else did, but, you know, even not so much hearing uh, reports from the PICU about cytokine storms and myocarditis and cephalitis, um, you know, the, the fear and the mental health challenges. For some reason, uh, that struck less panic in me than the discussions of unaccompanied alien ch children, uh, which, you know, is a term that is hard to square with the, the other term of tender age. Uh, hearing about these kids in ICE, or HHS OR custody uh, it just for me led to this mounting sense of terror at just hearing the accumulation of harm uh, uh, that these uh, children are facing. And, um, you know, and then the only relief that I uh, experienced in uh, during the presentation, Katie, was hearing about successful legal attacks on uh, these inhumane arrangements. Um, and, uh, and so again, I hope you will keep toggling between your experience as a clinician and as a critical observer. Um, 
Chuck, thank you so much uh, again um, for reminding us that the surge that we feared in the medical, in the, in, the, in the hospital system was actually occurring in nursing homes. And again, the, the, the steady and rather rapid accumulation of harm, you know, not just no touch policies, but also no visits, no communal meals. And finally, in spite of the best efforts of underpaid and overworked and threatened staff, no time even for face time, your depiction of, a, of the total ecosystem um, is, you know, ethnographically welcome and, and you know, uh, learning about how residents relate to patients, staff, and family members. Again, I, uh, I hope you will uh, continue this work, not just as a clinician, but as someone who's describing <clears throat> a low trust environment um, and, uh, you know, the comparison to uh, between a nursing home as a low trust environment and even the PICU that uh, Katie Peeler described uh, is, is instructive. Another reason to bring these local discussion on these local moral worlds together in a single um, two hour session. Um, and again, we're left with asking the question, what does it take to turn this around? Um, to my dear <clears throat> friend, Ed, who uh, was in fact the person who first taught me about contact tracing in 1984, um, I just want to start by saying congrats on Enzo's birth and more still congrats on being around to welcome him. Um, and uh, I'm, I share Arthur's gratitude for your willingness to just describe the uncertainty that you felt uh, as a future grandfather, but as, you know, a, 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 a member of the human race, not knowing what's going to happen. And your legal story um, of uh, objecting to a, a lawyerly view that the tenants of your co-op building should be uh, notified is just a reminder that, alas, a lot of the legal posturing that has been uh, in, seen in every aspect of this epidemic, a lot of it has been quite the opposite of what Katie Keeler described, which is the heroic use of legal remedies for uh, the oppressed and, again, people who, children who are faced with this incredible layering of, of uh, accumulated harm. Um, so thank you, Ed, for, for sharing that story with us. I'm glad you've written about it as well. Uh, Jean, um, your overview of the similarities and differences um, uh, between what you experienced, not just in West Africa, but in the Congo, and what you've experienced here as a clinician and as a, as a, a critical observer yourself, thank you very much. I, I think you remind us that there are uh, some similar visuals, but these are entirely different kind of experiences, certainly a three country epidemic. Um, you know, 99% of all the cases of Ebola that occurred during 19, uh, 2014, 2015, 99% uh, were just in those three countries, whereas this is uh, a truly a global pandemic and the mechanism of, of spread is different enough so that, uh, you know, one is more struck by the differences. Um, amazingly, as you point out, uh, a number of innovations or at least activities that occurred in West Africa and the Congo have yet to uh, be taken up here, contact tracing um, to slow uh, is, is finally coming online, I, I think. I'm not entirely sure why there was so much containment nihilism. We discussed this last week um, in the United States. It's hard to have clinical nihilism here it would, it, it would certainly be resisted um, by many, including by lawyerly responses, but we've had a fair amount of containment nihilism. I hope you're going to keep writing about that uh, as you uh, continue your work with the Africa CDC. Um, I'm never going to get tired of your spiel on epidemiology and mathematical models. Um, and uh, and I, and I certainly uh, think that suddenly the things that you've been writing about these last couple of years uh, are going to have real wide purchase as, uh, you know, people are familiar of much 
larger um, fraction of humanity uh, is familiar with the terms of the debates that you've been um, carrying on and, and contributing to yourself. So I hope that um, you're you're going to take heart that these are certainly not uh, readily seen now as obscure topics. And Scott, with an eye towards leaving a little bit of time for discussion, I'll turn it back over to you. And I just want to thank uh, you and Arthur um, and, and the speakers. Again, I found it um, uh, overwhelming, um, intimidating, um, distressing, uh, but instructive. So I thank all of you. Thank you, Paul. That was a <laughs> cogent summary. Um, we've been going for more than two hours. I, I, I don't really want this conversation to end. Um, I don't think anyone has the room after us, but I think uh, let's say we'll speak for about another 15 minutes or so. And I wanted to put everyone in conversation with one another. And Ed, you had brought up that you had some questions for your fellow panelists. So I'd like to give you the chance to, to ask those questions. Thanks, Scott. Uh, actually, um, one the question I think for for Catherine and pediatric, you know, we're all mystified by the low response. And, you know, so much of the illness in, in almost every infection, certainly tuberculosis, but I think this one as well, has to do with the host response. And, you know, in my little article, I described, you know, why, why do some people go on to this cytokine storm? And it occurs to me, and, and oh, by the way, you know, BCG, um, you know, long used um, with dubious um, re reputation for tuberculosis, is a viable uh, intervention for COVID. And Megan Murray, and I'm actually on that study as well, are looking to see whether BCG may actually provide some protection for healthcare workers through innate immunity. So my question for, for uh, Catherine is, I wonder, you know, children have not had as many coronaviruses as we uh, adults have had over the years. And so the conditioning of the immune system as we as we experience life uh, influences a lot. And, you know, maybe even some people have had more of certain kinds of conditioning of their immune system that results in this cytokine storm than others, because it's, it's certainly not all that. But I wonder what you think about the fact that we're looking at more immunologically naive um, hosts, which oftentimes tends to mean worse infection, but if the problem is overreaction, maybe uh, the prior experience with coronaviruses or similar viruses has an impact. What do you think about that crazy idea? That's a, it's a, it's a great thought. Um, I am not an immunologist, I'll start by saying that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's, con it's confusing because kids tend to you know, do less well um, with a lot of infectious diseases compared to adults. And we do see other coronaviruses in kids, but not often, honestly, like mostly what lands a kid in the ICU in terms of viral illnesses tends to be influenza A. Um, we've seen a ton of human metanumavirus that's actually caused a lot of problems um, earlier this year in a lot of kids, um, but very rarely other coronaviruses and, and certainly this one. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I like your theories. I will say the kids that we've seen it in, the kids who've actually had cytokine storm, what, we actually just submitted a case report the other day, um, are kids who actually had um, underlying but, but unknown immunodeficiencies. And so they have specific um, problems with their immunity such that they are predisposed to having essentially a macrophage activating type syndrome. And they have this very a kind of out of control hyperinflammatory state. Um, I'm not quite sure why with more naive immune systems, children in general aren't doing as well. I think there's been a lot of postulating about various ACE receptors and things along those lines that kids' lungs are, are differently developed um, from that perspective compared to um, adults, but that theory doesn't always work out because the ones who tend to do worse are younger children, um, like you know, infants and toddlers compared to like, you don't see a ton of 12 year olds. Um, you know, mostly what I've seen in terms of positive um, pediatric positive patients have either been small children um, or kids who are really more like young adults. Um, and then the vast majority tend to have an underlying comorbidity. Um, the ones, interestingly, this is not quite what you're asking, but interestingly, the ones I've seen who've been positive, who've been quote previously healthy, do almost uniformly have all had um, underlying mental health um, comorbidities. 
um, and, and, that, and that includes ones who've like been intubated and gotten very sick, who have no other um, quote medical problem. So I haven't quite, I can't explain that one to you yet, but I am looking at it. You know, as you, we, we love to be reductionists. So, you know, probably no one explanation is going to explain this interesting phenomenon. Real quick question for, or to comment on Charles. Just, you were saying how um, the, um, how, how intimate contact is exactly what nursing homes are about and how we've withdrawn that. So I've been visiting nursing homes uh, uh, at the behest of the Mass Department of Public Health, looking at it, whether there are any environmental controls that could be brought to bear. And when you look at the nursing home, and I've seen several now, the fact that there is such intimacy that people's daily functions um, from eating and um, toileting and, 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 and bathing are all required. I, it just makes me think that this is probably going to be the most difficult place to separate caregivers from uh, their patients or from residents uh, of all. And certainly I can't think of any environmental controls are going to be helping there. But I just want to emphasize that from a transmission perspective, it's really, really a challenge. It's a double bind. I, I feel like, um, you know, lots of moral distress here. I, what's one of the words I feel? Double binds, good for public health transmission, but it's horrible uh, in so many other ways. Right? It's done. Um, and you're causing lots of unintended consequences lots of unintended consequences that at the end, I'm not sure is the most important thing. And I think, uh, you know, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is. Um, um, and, and, uh, but I feel like the, the patient and resident's voice in how you contain uh, this virus, um, but do it in a way that is consistent with a person's health wishes and the family's health wishes. I, I think uh, we just weren't ready for that. Um, but it, it's double binds upon double binds that we're caught in. Um, you know, it, it's not so much that you, you couldn't actually go see the patients or the residents. Uh, they did let them in uh, at the end of life. There were certain conditions, but even then, they were touching their loved ones through gloves and gowns and masks. And, you know, it's heart wrenching. Um, so, yeah, Ed, uh, the work that you're doing with DPH, is that very recent or? or, or? The last couple of weeks, um, yeah. uh, DPH has formed a, uh, a on the ground team to yes. visit facilities to look at yep. them and the differences among them and the differences in rate of infection are dramatic. The last one I visited is a large rehab facility with both acute and, and residential or more long-term uh, residents. They had one COVID case. They've had as many as four, but no more than that. Very structured, very good screening. So, you know, things can be done, but in the more normal nursing home, um, with four beds sharing one bathroom. I think the prospects of uh, stopping, I, I think the only thing one can do is spend the money to create a less conducive environment for transfer between patients. Um, healthcare worker and, and, and resident or, or, and, or um, patient is another matter. And we should say that the risk for the healthcare worker is also substantial under those circumstances and not to be dismissed. Ed, I think earlier you had mentioned you had a question for, for, for Kim as well. Oh, oh, you're, you're muted right now. Yeah, I, I, I think I made the comment actually was rego with regard to the sign on the, uh, on the, um, the, the, the super who was uh, to be avoided in my own situation in my apartment building. I already made that point. Well, in the interest of time, Arthur, did you have any final questions for any any of the panelists? No, I thought I thought the uh, these interactions were were great, and we uh, you know the the whole thing was was good. The these are not the only uh, kinds of experiences that people are having, uh, and I would like to suggest that we 
to Scott and to Paul that we come back uh, perhaps in a month or two and do another one of these and that we make it both more global, that is that we have, uh, since uh, our department is a department of global health, we make it more global and then also we um, um, look um, not just at um, how um, someone like Ed has come through this, but we look at family care. I particularly think that's, as I think about what I would have liked to have heard more about here, it would be family care, family caregivers. And I, I think that, uh, I, I, anyway, I'm, I'm very, um, would be very happy to do another one in which we explore even more broadly the varieties of experiences of COVID. Well, our panelists today set a super high bar for any future panel. So, so I want to thank them. Each of you were terrifically thoughtful. Um, I learned a great deal from each of you. So, so thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Paul, as always, for anchoring these. Uh, I want to let the audience know that uh, next week we'll be hearing from Neil Baer. So there's much of, uh, in, in, in news about how science is, is presented or not presented or listened to or not listened to. And Neil, who is one of the forces behind ER um, is, is also part of our department now. We're honored to have him with us. And he'll be presenting next week on, on science and the media uh, related to COVID-19. So uh, very excited for that. So that will be next Thursday at 2 o'clock. Uh, sorry, next Thursday at noon from noon till 2 o'clock. So um, we welcome all of you next week. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.